You're listening to the Career Jump Podcast. Insights, interviews, and success stories to inspire and give you the edge when you make your next career jump. Hosted by your career concierge, Andrew McCaskill. Hello, welcome back to the Executive Career Jump Podcast. I'm your host and career concierge, Andrew McCaskill. Delighted today, actually, because we've got Matt Phelan from the Happiness Index who's come along to join us, and I'm excited about the type of topics we can cover. So thanks again for freeing up some time, Matt. It's great to see you. Thanks for having me, Andrew. Yep. So Matt and I have got a few mutual acquaintances, and I've also been following uh, some of his work online for a while. But for those of you that are listening and don't know about Matt, Matt, tell us a bit more about your background and the type of work you get involved with. Well, um, our mutual acquaintance, Andrew, uh, Colin Main, who is a teacher, we were born um, we were born in Essex in the same hospital at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> and we've been, we've been best mates ever since. So it's good to have kind of met you through that way. But yeah, I, I'm a, I suppose I'm an entrepreneur. I'm, I'm currently working on my second business. So my career started out in farming. So I was a farmer, um, which, saw, which does link to my story at some point. I then had a marketing career where we built up and sold a marketing agency, but I was obsessed. I'm a sort of a data geek type person, and I sort of became obsessed with how you can use culture to scale a business. And in the last business, we built a piece of technology to visualize the culture of our company. And that became the Happiness Index, which we spun out. We sold our business and then we should have retired. And then uh, we thought, I will take all the money and go all in again into the Happiness Index, which... At the beginning of the pandemic, I thought, what have I done to my family? But I, we seem to be doing that right okay. So, yeah, that's that's me, Andrew. I love it. So from growing crops to growing brands to growing teams. God, you, should, you should work in our marketing team. That's much better than what we say. <laughs> <laughs> Got a touch on the topic. And we've worked with quite a few founders who've exited and have then tried to work out what they want to do next. But mm. why, why didn't you uh, retire or kick back? What made you go again? Well, yeah, it's a good question. I think, I mean, this is subjective, but I still perceive myself as very young. Um, I'm still in my 30s and we were in our early 30s when we'd done it, done the first business. So I really felt that our first business was a very strong UK business. So I'm obsessed with football. So I felt like we'd won the Premier League. And then I felt like I want, I always had this thing that I wanted to take our previous business global. And the reason we sold the business is because we didn't have the confidence to take it into different countries. Um, but then through the sale of the business and the merger and the acquisition, we did go global and I loved that part of it. Um, so I felt like I had the unfinished business to see if I could take a business global, which is what we're doing with the Happiness Index. So yeah, it was just challenge, really. I love a challenge. I never started a company for money, and it sounds cliche, but it's not what drives me. So we didn't even save a penny, just went all in again, had no money, and, and we have to grow it to to pay for our children to, to live, basically. Absolutely love it. I love that. That is entrepreneurialism at its finest. I also like the fact you said you didn't start it for money, because I'm a believer that that's probably exactly why somebody saw value in buying it, was because you hadn't built it specifically with the cash exit in mind. Would you agree with that? I think after caveat was said, which is when I moved to London, and I think a lot of people listening will resonate with this, I was doing well in my career. I moved to London and I couldn't afford all my bills and rent. So there was a bit of it that was money driven where I thought I'm working at like the Guardian newspaper. I'm earning a good salary for someone in their twenties. But when I pay my rent and I pay my commute, and I have a couple of beers, there's not even, I'm into overdraft. So there was that part of it that it was driven from that. And there's a lot of people who find themselves in that situation now. And that's where you, I think it's more common to talk about the side hustle and stuff, but it wasn't about making millions of money. There was a money thing that drove me out of my comfort zone, which in the pandemic's interesting, isn't it? Because you can work from anywhere now. So that, that slightly dates the story, but no, absolutely, absolutely not. It wasn't about getting some money and then retiring because I love, I, I don't think I'll ever retire. I love, I just love, I love, I love working, which I know not everyone sees work as something they love, but for me, it's all intertwined into one. No, I totally understand that. So let's talk a bit more about the happiness index. And I saw a quote from you that said, the less happy you are, 
in your work, actually, annoyingly, the less likely you are to speak out about it. Tell us a bit more about this unhappiness that we're seeing in the workplace and what stops people from addressing it. Mm. So it's funny when I read back quotes about myself because I think, well, geez, did I, what was I, what, did I say that? <laughs> but I suppose let's just do it. To answer your question, Andrew, just do a quick geek out on the years, the last 18 months data because it has been, let's say, it, unprecedented times, cliche. It's been the unhappiest in our database globally that we've ever seen people, right? So there's no getting away from it. If you're listening to this Andrew's podcast and you're feeling you felt lethargic or unhappy or, or unmotivated, welcome to the club, right? Majority of people have felt like that. Um, so one of the things is don't get yourself down about it. Leaders that are listening, we've observed something called an emotional deficit. So in the pandemic, and this links back to the quote, Andrew, which is in the pandemic, employees have wanted to speak times four, four times more than they normally would to their leadership teams. The reason some people, when they're unhappy, don't speak out is because they are in a survival mode. So it's like survive, it's like the fight or flight state. So if people are feeling really down, they're actually not in the right environment to speak out. And I think um, one of the connections that you have to my friend Andrew is football. And I think if I look at, let's, I don't want to overuse football analogies, but because we've just had the Euros, I think what Gareth Southgate has done is allow people to have a voice within the team. And I think he's created a culture that where people feel safe to speak out. So I think in cultures where it's not a strong culture, people don't feel like they can, they can have that voice and speak out. So I think that's where some of the research that we were talking about on the previous podcast no, that makes perfect sense. He really has as well in terms of he hasn't tried to censor any of the players. He's kind of suggesting that they use their platform for what they're passionate about, which is great, isn't it? Yeah. Guess what? Are they, these, it's the problem with like judging someone on their career, isn't it? Like you could say, oh, if someone's an accountant, you would say potentially someone might say, oh, that's a boring career or whatever, or they're boring just because they're accountant. And footballers get the same sort of stuff, don't they? Just because someone earns a lot of money, it doesn't mean they're going to be selfish. You've only got to look at Rock, uh, Marcus Rashford um, and see what he's done in the last last 10 to 18 months, which is, has been amazing. And I, I mean, also bring out the, out of the surface, Andrew, you're an Arsenal fan and I'm a Tottenham fan. I don't know if you saw... But in my lifetime, the first ever Arsenal player to be applauded at Tottenham was yesterday. Did you see that? No, I didn't see it. So Saka came on for Arsenal and was applauded by the Spurs fans. Yeah. So it was a marker. It was a, an acknowledgement of what he's been through with the racist abuse and stuff of the That's Spurs amazing. fans. And they support him. So <laughs> obviously a quite a neighbourly um, thing between Tottenham and Arsenal. For that to happen is quite a beautiful thing for Tottenham fans to come together with Arsenal fans. And the first time I've known in my history of being a fan to come together to fight racism, I think is a, is a good story that should be shared. No, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. And I think leaders have got their work cut out or definitely feel like they've got their work cut out at the moment because employees want to be more flexible, understandably. I think we've all seen the benefits of people having you know, a hybrid type structure or even a fully remote structure, depending on what kind of work you're in. But they also want that connection, don't they? And you know, what do you think a good balance looks like in terms of companies? They're trying to get both more digital, but more human at the same time in many ways. Yeah, and I think the workload one is an interesting one, Andrew, because actually, we, we call this quantum working, what, what we would say the answer to, to this is, which is it's more, it's more of a natural way, but it really gets crazy. It's built on like quantum mechanics, but it's around seeing all your employees as energetic beings and understanding where their energy comes from. Um, but actually, if you, if you loosen things up and allow people to work out what the right environment for them is, um, you, you find as a leader, you've probably got less work um, a good example of that would be the the Netflix, uh, I think it's the Netflix CEO, he, they were criticised because they have unlimited holiday. And everyone was like, well, everyone's just going to take 365 days holiday. And the CEO said, well, we don't have a, um, a dress code policy and people don't turn up to work, work naked. And I love that example because if you build something based on trust 
um, you have the ability to allow people to thrive. If you build something based on control, you're just going to end up creating a lot of work for yourself. And I always think that, I always admire micromanagers because I, how do you have the time to micromanage? Because I just don't have enough hours in the day with my young family and, and blah, blah, blah to be interfering in my team's work. So I do think if leaders can part their ego a little bit and empower their people, they should find it's less work. Yes, no, that's very true. And how do we keep people connected in, a, in the digital world that we're working I think we need to acknowledge that it can be harder, but it can be done. So two things. So just to give you some really cool, interesting new science. So if we were in a room together, our hearts emit um, an electromagnetic magnetic field out about 1.5 meters. So nobody in science really knows what that is yet or what that could mean. But it, in some terms, that could be an aura. Um, in some terms, it could just be an electromagnetic magnetic field. Um, but I think what the latest sort of neuroscience and quantum mechanics that, that we're starting to look at shows is there is an impact on each other when we are face to face and people do feel that. But I don't think that means you can't have a remote first organization that thrives. I just think you have to decide which one you're going to be. And, and even in the happiness index, we're trying to draw those plans up ourselves because we were like sort of four days a week in the office, one day a week at home in general. And then the pandemic happened. We went remote first, but we haven't really kind of reset what we stand for. And I think you need to agree that because let's say a company goes remote first tomorrow or virtual only. Once they make that decision, certain employees will leave because it's not for them. And certain employees will be attracted to that company. And there's that process of finding out what works and what doesn't work. But you need to sort of like put your put your stake in the sand, don't you? And say, this is what we stand for so that people can work out. Uh, do they want to be part of what that future company is? So I think I think visualizing and talking about what you actually are, are going to move forward with, I think is really important. And at the Happiness Index, we're having those conversations literally today. Yeah. Yeah. So offer clarity and then you'll allow people to opt in to yeah. the clarity that you're offering them. So I'll, get, so I'll give you some data on that, Andrew. So at the beginning, I said it's been the unhappiest year on record, right? But there are certain job functions where people have become happier. So engineers are on, in general, in our data, which comes across 100 different countries, we're an employee engagement and happiness platform. So we're collecting this data every second. And on average, engineers across the globe in the last 18 months have become happier. So it... This data is really important because if you're running an engineer, a pure engineering company, maybe um, it's better to let everyone work from home because they don't necessarily like people like me walking around the office trying to chat to them about what, what the Spurs Arsenal match was like yesterday. They might want to have their headphones in and get on with their work. So you've got to, there's the broad data, but you've got to drill down in it to get the, get the interesting stories. And is it more, this is fascinating. Thank you for uh, sharing that, Matt. Is it more nuanced than just introverts love it as in the remote side and extroverts detest it or is there more to it than that there's definitely a bit more to it <laughs> because for example an introvert might enjoy the actual process of getting on the train and using the train time mm. it's actually about firstly it's kind of the it brings into conversation the equality or equity debate so Equality is everyone has exactly the same options. Equity, um, which you hear more about in the diversity conversations now, takes into consideration someone's background and circumstances. So, for example, if you had someone that had to arrive to work in a wheelchair, offering them an equal opportunity to someone who walks into work actually is not equality, which is why equity is such an important conversation. So what we where we wrap it all up in the happiness index is what we call freedom to be human. So freedom to be human is our vision, which people think is a marketing statement, but really it's based on um, our data from millions of employees that says effectively, if you treat someone as an individual and cater to them, the overall company will perform better, which is hard to do. But I think that's the role of every leader, like whoever you is in your team, that's your job, finding out what makes them tick. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like your children play football and stuff like that. It's, 
a coach, that's a coach's job, whether it's football or it's work. Like one of your employees may need one thing, another may need another approach. And I think that's what modern leadership's about. No, entirely right. Yeah, entirely right. And creating an ecosystem whereby people think they can thrive and plug into it in a way that makes sense for them. I totally see that. And that's an exciting vision, right? In terms of where we've been with work historically versus what you're painting. Hey everybody, it's uh, Andrew here. Just wanted to very briefly interrupt this podcast episode to tell you a little bit more about our Career Jump Club. So our Career Jump Club was created to help job seekers understand what they want and how to get it, right? So becoming a club member is a great move if you're looking to get the clarity and confidence in order to secure your next role. With the membership, you get a number of different things. So first thing you get is access to our online platform, which has over 30 videos, 40, 50 different templates, workbooks, and it takes you through everything from sort of understanding what you want to how to position your CV and LinkedIn, how to interview, how to close offers and negotiate better salaries, a full end-to-end job search course effectively for senior leaders. So you get that, you get a fortnightly group coaching call Um, which is with me and with the other members where we bounce around best practice, share slide decks, share techniques and share the latest data on what's working for people. And you get to most importantly become part of our closed LinkedIn group and our closed community. And in there is where the magic often happens because you get people referring each other into opportunity, supporting each other and just share it. And that's what it's all about. So if you're financially able and you'd like to invest in your job search, head on over to www exec exec careerjump.com or one word forward slash club and you'll find the landing page and come and give it a go we'll see you in there anyway back to the pod yeah um do you feel optimistic that despite what the data has been telling you that we can evolve out of this into something that looks and feels better i think i did an analysis a few probably a couple of months ago i reckon on average i speak to about 100, I did some analysis in a 12 month period, I'd spoke to 104 CEOs. And if, and if I just make it, let's make it 99. Yeah, let's make it 99. Just to keep the math simple because I might have got a small brain. I would say of those CEOs that I met about 33 of those intuitively understand that it's good to look after your people and their club conversation we're having. I would say 33 of those CEOs, if you show them the data and the business case behind it, they'll do it. I still think there's a third in there that just don't get this stuff. And I think that is where success breeds arrogance, contempt issues here. Because if someone has been leading a company for the last 10 years and that company has been financially successful, they tend to do what they've done the last 10 years. What I often say back to them is you need to consider whether you have achieved that success in spite of your culture. And I'll, again, I keep leaning on football because obviously Colin texts me to say that you're a gooner, but if I review Arsenal and I look at Arsene Wenger, one of the things that he brought to Arsenal was, how about this guys? We don't get out and get drunk all week before we play football. So pre like Arsene Wenger, it was standard that footballers went out and got drunk. So if you do something different, you get the advantage of that. So I think there's a lot of industries where everyone's treated their employees pretty much the same, Um, which means if you've been successful in that way, you just continue. Whereas actually you could make a leap forward and use all this data and science to to make a difference. And there are certain sectors that just treat people better than others. And then some sectors adopt stuff quicker. Yeah. Oh, I think it's really interesting the amount of investment going into customer experience. Mm. You see loads of money going into CX and customer experience in general. And my mind always goes back to, well, the old classic of, well, happy people deliver happy customers, right? So yeah. what you're kind of, you're in a symptom versus cause discussion there around, yeah. why aren't you investing in those people that are looking after you so that they can look after your customers? Yeah. It's crazy that. It's yeah, crazy. And that's why we built the happiness index. We wanted to correlate our mission statement in our marketing agency used to be personal client agency growth. So what it meant is if we look after the individuals, the individual looks after the clients and then the agency will financially grow. That was like our day-to-day thing. But because we were data people, we started questioning, but is that true? Is it actually, does it actually correlate? 
And that's what we found out in version one of the happiness index before it became uh, a separate company all on its own. So it was originally invented to only find out that answer to that question, Andrew. <laughs> I love that. That's a quality origin story. While we've got you, I wanted to ask you a couple of career-based questions as well. Mm. That's all right. Mm. So with everything you know about work environments and, you know, how to set people up for Thrive, a lot of the people that listen to this are in some kind of transition. So may have been made redundant or on the lookout for a new role. What do you think they should be doing to assess the right next move for them or to assess what kind of employer might be good for them or yeah, you know, that, that fit? when they're out interviewing so i'm going to start with something slightly controversial which is so i've moved i'm just literally counting it out in front of you so i moved from my first job to london so that's one move then i was work then my company got acquired by the guardian so i moved to Saatchi. so that was two moves and i quit so I, yeah so i quit my job to start my own company and then sold my company and then reinvested so i've moved four times every time i've moved it's been for way less money than I have before. So I know this is slightly controversial, but I have always looked for learning. Where can I learn? So for me, your you move has to be long term. And in all cases, in the short term, I have earned less money. But in the long term, and hopefully with the happiness index, quick fingers crossed, it results in me earning more money. And I think that goes back to, again, our data shows that happier people perform better at work. So, and this goes back to the rat race thing and so on and so on. I've got so many close friends at all different ages. I've said, just quit, just do this. The problem with that is you have to give up the guaranteed two or three holidays a year. You have to, in my case, you have to put your, your property on the line. So it's different when you're talking about starting your own business or, or whatever, but I would say, look at the learning opportunity. So the best examples I can think of is think of really famous, amazing people that are dead and think, how much would you pay to go and work with them for a couple of weeks? Like if you could go and it doesn't matter whether you like or respect or not like them, like sounds like Steve Jobs was probably a complete idiot from uh, how he looked after employees. But most people would probably pay like, to work with him for a month than versus get paid. So I'm not saying uh, don't work. I'm not saying work for free and, and, and you need to get paid your value and so on and so on. But I would look at the learning journey because learning is important for my happiness. So start with what you, what makes you happy. And I think this is why we're seeing the great resignation, Andrew. I think people have had a chance to stop and go, you know what, I'm, I am going to change. So, yeah, just look at it from your happiness perspective. For me, learning and development. If I'm not learning and develop, developing, I'm, I get bored really quickly. And to give you one last bit of data, which I'll use a lyric to help you remember. So, you know, Billy Ocean, when the, towing, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. Yep, love it. Um, when the going gets boring, the good get moving. I know that's a crap lyric that I've just given you. <laughs> but people move when they're bored. That's the data behind it. So if you've got employees, make sure you're looking at their development because if they're starting to get bored, they'll move. Most people blame it on loads of other stuff like money or perks or this, that, the other. People's personal development plans, absolutely key. Yeah, absolutely right. I love that, mate. There's so much gold in there. It was brilliant. Thank you. You mentioned setting up on your own. One trend we've really seen with our own clients is as people have taken that time to reflect over the last 18 months or so, more and more people choosing to roll the dice and have a go at their own thing, which for me yeah. is a really positive thing to see. Right? I, I had to get fired in order to do what I knew I should do. <laughs> you know, it's true. I didn't, you know, have, you done that, a podcast on that? have you done a podcast on that, Andrew? No, no, we don't want Please. to go there. I'd like to, um, I'd like to invite you live back onto my podcast to, and we're going to call it why getting fired is a good thing for your career. Well, it was, it was a good thing because I knew what I wanted to do, but I didn't have, I was addicted to the identity and, the fact that I was seen as success, success in others' eyes, even though I felt like crap internally, I stayed with it to your point earlier. Yet I'm now encouraging as many people as possible to align who they are with what they do. Well, we need to get we need to get back to that. And so everyone in a couple of weeks, come on happiness and humans, and we'll I'll, Andrew, I'll have Andrew on there answering that in more I'd detail. Love, I'd love to, yeah. But what I was going to ask you is 
what do you have having been through this cycle a number of mm. times and obviously you've had some success as it goes what do you see as the pros and cons of business ownership versus employing employment so really good question i think what technology is doing is removing the power base from the corporates um and what that that doesn't mean big companies are not going to survive but what happens now is if companies treat people badly lots of employees can get together and do everything from complain to start their own company so what i think will be the future um, and this is what we talk about is something we call the quantum way there's a book written by clive highland called the quantum way it's the follow-up to my book freedom to be happy but it's about this energetic beings what i think the future looks like is because when you take away everything that a company's got right when you take away the brand, da, 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 da. all it is is one uh, legal entity invoicing the other legal entity for services provided, right? So what I envisage moving forward, thanks to technology and freedom and everything, is that everyone, beca you become Andrew.com and I become Matt.com and uh, Lisa, who's listening, becomes Lisa.com, right? But we come together on purpose-driven events that can be micro and macro. So a micro event like that might be this podcast. Me and you have come together as separate entities to uh, record this podcast. A macro event might be me and you decide that we want to start a moon base. We, um, we focus everything on that, right? But what technology has allowed us to do is be more flexible with the container. All a company is is a container on that. So firstly, I just, that's where I see the world go going because of technology um, and how we can market ourselves better as individuals and LinkedIn and so on. I think my personal view is I think freelance is the worst of both worlds. And I total, if you are a freelancer and you love freelancing, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just talking about from my perspective, which is when you're an employee, there's a lot of amazing things that you get like everything gets paid, you get a holiday. There's a lot of perks to being an employee, being able to relax on a Saturday and not worry about this. As an entrepreneur, you take the high risk, but you have a team to support you. So I'm going away on holiday soon. I can actually go on holiday because I've got a team to support me. In the middle, there's this freelance piece, which is very feast and famine for people. So I see a lot of people who quit their jobs to do freelance, and then within six or 12 months, they're back in companies because it's really stressful as a freelancer because you might have loads of work, you work really hard, and then you think, oh, should I go on holiday? But you don't know because there might not be any work there in November. So I'm a massive fan of encouraging people to do it. Um, but my advice to anyone that who's doing it, I think there's some stat like, I think you the rate of failure is about 90% of a new startup, right? So you go right against it straight from day one, like you've got a 10% chance of success. But if you do it with someone who's done it before, I think that uh, chance of success goes up from 10% to about 55%. So that doesn't have to be a co-founder. That can be a mentor, it can be a coach, and so on and so on. So what I would say is if you're going to do it, attach people to your, what people call sphere of influence that you can talk to and get advice from. There's no, is it Mike Tyson says, everyone's got a strategy so they get punched in the face? Like running your own business, absolutely brutal. You are out there in the wild. It is the only way I can describe it. It's like being a domesticated, being a domesticated dog and then becoming a wild wolf. Like it's just brutal, but the freedom you get from it is amazing. But if you've got some wing people with you, it will increase your chances massively. Amazing stare in there. I love that. It's just so true about technology has democratized everyone's ability to compete for sure yeah like when i think about things like canva right like for people like me that don't have a design bone in their body i can create something on canva which is yeah. of a half decent standard when it comes to a pitch deck or a social post it's incredible isn't it really in terms of how all the pieces can bolt together and for not a huge outlay you can become competitive very quickly yeah when we started our first business the iPhone 1 was out, but the iPhone 2 wasn't. So the iPhone 2 was the first one that was uh, connected, was, that, was actually connected into like Wi-Fi and everything. So even when we started in 2008, you had to still get your laptop in, a, in an actual physical room to check your email. Like that's how quickly stuff changes. You can run a business from a, an iPhone. Like, it's just you can do it so low tech if that's what you want to do. But 
but you also don't just do it because it's the fashionable thing. I, I've definitely noticed an increase of that. It's got you, if you are an entrepreneur, it's inside you deep and it comes to you at all the weird times, like four o'clock in the morning or when you're going for a run, you'll know it. It's inside you. If you're not sure about it, it's, it's probably not for you, but it will just come to you at the point when you just can't slip. You suddenly it will just overtake you and you've got to do it. So I think most, I think a lot of people have that in them, but they just don't have the confidence or, or a friend around them to encourage them to do it. Totally agree. Totally agree. But if you're listening, give it a go. You know if you're unemployable. You know, you know deep down if you're unemployable. Yeah, um, I'm definitely unemployable. <laughs> yeah, me too. And I knew that for a long time before I took the leap. And um, that's fine. But no, great, great, great advice there. In terms of content then, what other than your, your own book, of course, which you mentioned earlier, what other books uh, would you recommend on, on this topic that have helped shape your thinking or podcasts or anything Ooh. other that have had an effect on how you think about all of this? I think a really nice coffee table starter without getting into the technical ins and outs of it all is that is written by my friend uh, got the best danish name ever it's called mike viking uh the v is spelt with a w so it's like i think it's like m-e-i-k for mike and then it's like viking and w like viking but with a w and it's called the little book of Huga. it's spelt higger like as an english person would say it but it's pronounced Huga. check it check it out it's just it's a really nice intro into the Danes um, who are a leader in a lot of this research. Um, Huga isn't a direct translation for happiness. It means something that it, us in England can't really understand because the closest we've got to it is cosy. But I've asked a Danish person, like, what does co- c- can you be cosy on a beach in the summer when you're sunbathing? And they say, yes. Oh, brilliant. So Andrew, for, the pop- for those that are not on video, Andrew's showing, is it? I just think that's a really nice place to start and it looks beautiful on your coffee table. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. It's really interesting, actually, how it talks about setting up environments and the power of light and all sorts of different things. A great recommendation on that. Brilliant. Love those insights. I think we've covered a heap, actually, in a really short period of time. And I love how, as well as putting your own flair on it, you're backing everything up with data as well. That's that's awesome. Uh, for anybody that's listening that wants to follow you, get in touch reach out in some sort of way what are the best ways to connect with you and what you're doing yeah i mean we've just we just made a i don't know a seven hundred thousand pound gamble by allowing people to use the happiness index for free for three months (laughs) which is decimated absolutely decimated our pipeline because we had a normal commercial pipeline but we felt like people struggle to move we underestimated how much of a leap it is to move from engagement to engagement and happiness for some people so now we just say, look, rather than reading about us or getting a pitch or a presentation or whatever, if you're over, I, th- I think if you're under 100 employees, you can do most of the stuff that we do intuitively. Like, I don't think it, it necessarily works that. Although we do have some customers at area, but I would say go to thehappinessindex.com, book a demo and, and use our product for free for three months. It's literally the best way because you can, rather than happen to, Uh, listen to me on my podcast happiness and humans or read the book just go and collect some data and and then go and listen and read the book and stuff so try a free trial and see the power of the data really i love that well make sure you take him up on that offer i didn't realize you were uh, giving it away now but um, i think the collective findings if we can get enough people to plug in and do that the collective findings from the data set you'll have will be amazing so yeah it's to, as we go towards somebody just to share something like on happiness so we all have different drivers of happiness but it changes via country but the same driver of happiness is number one in every country which is relationships so relationships is number one driver of happiness at work but in each country the second third fourth fifth sixth driver of happiness and so on change so, for example, in America, the second driver of happiness is clarity, whereas in Canada, it's acknowledgement. So, if so you might assume that you could have the same HR strategy for Canada and America, but that data shows you how different those two countries operate from a cultural perspective. So, I'm just a geek. I want to get some more data in, Andrew, in this podcast. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks, June. So, I can't wait to see the data that you come up with over the next few years as you continue on this work. I think it's really important work. And I think you've shared heaps today. So thanks for giving up your time. It's been much appreciated. All right, thanks. thanks for inviting me on, Andrew. Okay, see you soon. Come on, you Spurs. You've 
been listening to the Career Jump podcast with Andrew McCaskill. For more resources and information, just head over to the Career Jump website at www.execcareerjump.com to supercharge your job search and start making moves. Let's get to work. Let's get to work.